The anatomy of cerebral veins, huh? It's something we don't talk that much about. We talk a lot about the arteries because the arteries are supplying blood to the brain. So they're supplying oxygen, they're supplying glucose. The brain uses a huge amount of energy constantly and just a handful of seconds of interruption of blood flow to the brain will result in a loss of consciousness. And shortly after that, temporary damage to parts of the brain, permanent damage to the brain. But the cerebral veins are taking that blood away from the vein, so there are some interesting and important anatomical concepts to deal with there. And we have cerebral vein structures that are worth knowing about. Uh, and the things that we worry about are the bridging veins and thrombosis. <music> Okay, I've got to hit you with a couple of concepts first. Here is the Brian. Um, the arteries supplying blood to the, bri the brain uh, come in from inferior aspects. We have the two uh, internal carotid arteries, the two vertebral arteries, so the arterial blood enters under here and gives off, you know, three major pairs of cerebral arteries. Um, those arteries give off smaller branches and smaller branches and smaller branches and surround and cover the brain and give off arterioles. Those small blood vessels, those arterioles, uh, the brain is covered with pia mater. Those small blood vessels are going to pierce the pia mater. They're going to go into the brain tissue and uh, the grey matter is around the outside of the brain. These are the neuron cell bodies the synapses, the connections, and then we have the white matter, which are the axons of the neurons, you know, extending to other parts of the brain, other parts of the body, carrying action potentials with them. So those small blood vessels, they enter the brain, and then we see the capillary beds inside the brain, loads and loads of capillaries inside the brain. This is an organ, as I said, uses a huge amount of energy, huge amount of blood, lots of capillaries. The capillary beds in the gray matter are more dense, so there are more tiny capillary blood vessels uh, and there are also capillary beds in the white matter, but it's a little bit less dense. So with a capillary bed, just like any other organ, we have that arterial blood coming in, is pushed through the capillary bed, the venous blood comes out of the other side of the capillary bed and that venous blood is collected into small blood vessels and venules which then drain to larger veins, larger and larger venous blood vessels. Um, but that means that the arterial blood comes in inferiorly, spreads throughout the brain tissue, and then the veins that come out of the cerebral hemispheres, well, they pass in every which direction, really. Um, we have dural venous sinuses, which I've talked about elsewhere, around the brain in the dura mater. And the cerebral veins, they can flow superiorly, inferiorly, from deep to superficial, and so on. So that's the flow. That's what the cerebral veins are doing. And that means that the pattern of cerebral veins does not match the pattern of cerebral arteries. Now, on this brain, we can see um, some of the connective tissues covering the brain, which are covering the blood vessels. But we can actually see some of the veins and some of the arteries. Cerebral veins are more variable than cerebral arteries, um, you know, in their anatomy, in their location, in their number, in where they run, and they don't have any valves. The other advantage to that variability in cerebral vein anatomy means that there are lots of anastomoses, there are lots of links, there are lots of routes for potential collateral circulations, alternate routes of blood flow, if a vein does get blocked. But I will point out the major cerebral veins, the ones that people talk about, right? Okay, we can group the cerebral veins into deep cerebral veins and superficial cerebral veins. Uh, the deep cerebral veins we should look at first. They're down here now. Like most brain anatomy, it's not like other parts of the body where you can pull apart, pull away layers and see what's underneath and pull away that layer and see what's underneath. It's a soft tissue. <laughs> it's difficult to dissect. Um, I'm going to use some pipe cleaners. Okay, uh, half head, right? So we're looking at a mid-sagittal section there. Um, the internal cerebral vein, um, 
Well, we, we kind of, so this depression here is the third ventricle. Um, there's the, that bulge there is the thalamus. This kind of venous structure here that we're seeing, I would normally describe as the, the choroid plexus that's producing cerebrospinal fluid, right? But at this end here, this is where the lateral ventricles will drain CSF into the third ventricle. That's where we find the interventricular foramen. So the internal cerebral vein kind of starts there, curves around, yeah, something like that. Um, starts there, curves around the thalamus over the top of the third ventricle. This is the corpus callosum here, and it's gonna kind of, it's gonna kind of hook around there. And it's gonna drain at this end into the great cerebral vein the vein of Galen, so the great cerebral vein of Galen. And that's actually two names put together there. Um, and that will then pass to the, oh, there we go. Well, that's the straight sinus there. So that's where the internal cerebral vein would run. There are two, there's a left one and a right one. So although this model is in the, uh, the mid sagittal section, this vein is a little bit off that, so it's a little bit more lateral. So the left and right internal cerebral veins are draining very, very deep structures of the cerebrum. Um, and those two internal cerebral veins, as I said, posteriorly where my thumb is, will come and drain into the great cerebral vein. Of Galen. Um, basal veins. Okay, so now we need to look at the base of the brain. So frontal lobe. So there's the optic chiasm there, the two optic nerves. Now the basal veins of Rosenthal, again, basal cerebral veins, cerebral veins of Rosenthal, it's two separate names you kind of get lumped together. Um, they will start on either side, left and right sides. They'll start up by the optic chiasm. You've got the deep middle cerebral vein and some other small deep veins coming together there to form a larger vein. Now this lobe here, this is the temporal lobe, right? Uh, this is the brain stem, so there's kind of like the cerebral peduncles, the stalks connecting the brain stem to the cerebrum there. But the basal veins of Rosenthal, oh, that's, that's, that's all right, will um, do something like that. So they'll start up by the optic chiasm, and then they will curve around from anterior to posterior, on the medial surface of the temporal lobe around that cerebral peduncle. And they will also then drain to the great cerebral vein like the internal cerebral veins do back here. Let me make another one. Remember, these are pipe cleaners. So they are an approximation of the anatomy. But I'm trying to show you visually where these things are. So these are the left and right basal veins, cerebral basal veins. Uh, of Rosenthal. So these basal veins are also draining deep structures of the cerebrum. So we're talking basal ganglia, thalamus, that sort of thing, right? So those basal veins and the internal cerebral veins, as I said, they drain into the great cerebral vein, which is posteriorly back here. Um, and inside the cranial cavity, uh, the dura mater has dural venous sinuses within it. So the dura mater is a thick, tough connective tissue that holds the brain in place, helps protect and support everything. Uh, and inside there, we find the dural venous sinuses. So the great cerebral vein of Galen will drain to the straight sinus, which is actually a dural venous sinus, uh, which will then drain back to, we've got the transverse sinuses back here. So essentially, the deep cerebral veins go to the great cerebral vein, which then goes to the straight sinus and into the um, dural venous sinuses. Now the dural venous sinuses will all drain to the internal jugular vein and down the neck. I've talked about the dural venous sinuses elsewhere. If you want to find those, search YouTube for my name and whatever topic you're interested in and you'll probably find it if I've talked about it. So those are the deep cerebral veins, the major ones. Um, the superficial cerebral veins then are on the surface, draining the superficial parts of the cerebrum. Um, the one that's most interesting is probably the middle, um, 
the superficial middle cerebral vein. So this is the temporal lobe here, the frontal lobe and parietal lobe. And you see we've got this, this fissure here, right? This is the lateral sulcus. It's a nice landmark. It's nice and easy to find on brains. Also gets called the sylvian fissure. And there is, actually but there is on this model here, look, there's a vein running in that fissure. So this is the superficial middle cerebral vein. Um, also gets called the sylvian vein. You can see why, right? And it's draining small veins from, you know, small superficial veins from the surface of the cerebrum and the blood is flowing in this direction. So from posterior to anterior and that blood is going to drain into the cavernous sinus here on either side or the sphenoparietal sinus down here somewhere. So that's the superficial middle cerebral vein there. That's a pretty reliable one, right? And then you can see there's a smattering, a variety of superficial cerebral veins. They, they get, you know, grouped as superior cerebral veins and inferior cerebral veins. And what we've got up here, this is, that is the dura mater that I was talking about there. And up here is the superior sagittal sinus up there. Now the, the, the superior superficial cerebral veins will drain the superior parts of the cerebrum, um, the surfaces here and the medial surfaces, and those are going to run back to that superior sagittal sinus. So we have a group of superior superficial cerebral veins draining blood superiorly up there to the superior sagittal sinus. The inferior cerebral veins are then going to drain it's going to be a variety of veins draining the surface of the cerebrum inferiorly in that direction, which means that they're draining to the cranial floor down here. And down here we see that cavernous sinus, so they're going to drain to the cavernous sinus, sphenoparietal sinus, petrosal sinuses, uh, transverse sinus, and so on. Just got two more superficial veins for you that tend to be uh, quite reliable. Um, there is a superior anosmotic vein and an inferior anosmotic vein. I said there are lots of anastomoses, and anastomosis is a link between blood vessels, right? So you have a blood vessel going from A to B, and this one going from C to D. If they were linked by a bridge, that would be an anastomosis. Um, so we go back to that, mid, that superficial middle cerebral vein, and we go to the posterior end, <laughs> and we use our imagination. We see this vein here, right, running from uh, the posterior end of the superficial middle cerebral vein, and it's running superiorly up to the superior sagittal sinus. That is probably the superior anosmotic cerebral vein of Trollard, because that's the route that it takes. And then the inferior anosmotic vein of Labé Right, what it's going to do is it's, uh, okay, so we've got that superficial middle cerebral vein here. Again, at the posterior end, the inferior anosmotic vein is going to run back to the transverse sinus, which is back here. So, so let's say it's, 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 it's that one maybe. Yeah, sure, that one there, right? The inferior anosmotic cerebral vein or the cerebral vein of Labé. So that's going to take it back to the transverse venous sinus. So the superficial cerebral veins are also draining back to these dural venous sinuses, right? Okay, so those are the superficial and deep cerebral veins. And this takes us to the concepts of bridging veins and thrombosis. Um, so the brain is covered in pia mater. Uh, the cerebral veins are largely running in this space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater, which is the subarachnoid space. The arachnoid mater is tightly stuck to the dura mater. So the cerebral veins are going to pass their blood to the dural venous sinuses. The bridging veins are the bits of vein that have to kind of traverse that gap from the brain to the dura mater, that little gap with cerebrospinal fluid in that subarachnoid space. And 
the first parts of the, the dura mater, right? This means that a sudden deceleration of the head, because the brain is floating in cerebrospinal fluid inside the skull, the skull can stop and the brain can continue moving a little way inside the skull. If this rapid deceleration means that those bridging veins are the ones that are likely to stretch and tear. These bridging veins are subdural, so this would be a subdural hematoma, a subdural hemorrhage. This would be a, a venous bleed, it would be a slow onset bleed and blood would accumulate um, deep to the dura mater. Now in terms of thrombosis, okay on the arterial side we kind of expect a clot to form somewhere else and rush up through the arteries to the brain. Now in the venous side what we've got here is we've got a lower pressure, We've got the potential for slower flowing blood, for eddies, for conditions that can lead to inappropriate thrombosis, inappropriate formation of clots in venous vessels in the cerebrum. And you've seen there are some deep cerebral veins and some superficial cerebral veins and we have dual venous sinuses. So potentially a thrombus could block any one of these veins. Um, and again, um, well, because these veins are all over the cerebrum, these can have localized effects. These can have a range of different effects, cause a range of different signs and symptoms. But being venous blood, it is often, again, slow onset, a gradual change. Um, but because of the large number of anastomoses, the large potential for, alt, you know, for changes, for backup flow, as it were, the, the effects of these uh, venous thromboses might be, might be smaller, might be less of an effect. One thing of note is that a, a, a blockage, a thrombus in a cerebral vein can affect the blood-brain barrier, can cause edema, which could raise the intracranial pressure and give all those knock-on effects. So intracranial pressure can be link those two ideas up, okay? Um, but yes, yeah, so we need to think about bridging veins when we think about cerebral veins, and we need to think about a thrombosis, a, th a clot, a blockage in some of these veins um, as a possibility in, in some of the patients that you might see. But there you go, there's the anatomy of the cerebral veins, the ones that we talk about, and to be honest, not many people talk about them. But I hope that was useful and interesting, and maybe completed your understanding of blood flow to, through, and out from the brain. See you next week. Thank you.